that concludes general questions and we'll turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The resignation of two Chief Constables onto our third head of the Scottish Police Authority, an investigations body that's overwhelmed by complaints and a Justice Secretary pulling the strings when it suits him. Can the First Minister really say that over the last five years the single police force has been well managed? First Minister. Well, our, our police officers, the length and breadth of the country, do an exemplary job. It is because of the exemplary job that our police officers are doing that we have rates of crime in Scotland that are now more uh, than uh, at a 40 year, uh, more than a 40 year low. Uh, of course, there are issues in the leadership uh, of Police Scotland. Uh, I've recognised that in this chamber before, as has the Justice Secretary. Uh, the Chief Constable uh, tendered his resignation yesterday. That is entirely a matter for him. I respect that decision. But what it does allow now is for policing in Scotland to move forward uh, with a clear focus on delivering the long-term strategy, which, of course, Phil Gormley helped to develop. Uh, that uh, is what will happen now. It will obviously now be for the Scottish Police Authority to decide what further consideration uh, would be uh, appropriate in terms of the timescale for appointing uh, a new uh, Chief Constable. So I hope all of us uh, can continue to support our police officers as they do that important job across the country in keeping all of us safe. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. <coughs> President officer, I take my hat off to the rank and file officers that do the exemplary job that they do. But I do think they deserve better than they've had in the last five years. And here's the thing, this parliament voted to create a single police force. But this parliament also has a duty to learn from mistakes where they are exposed and to put them right. And I think there's an, an obvious flaw. The head of the Scottish Police Authority is supposed to be independent of government. Yet it's the Justice Secretary that appoints them. And as this affair has shown us, that same Justice Secretary can pull the head of the Scottish Police Authority into a room and make him change his mind. Does the First Minister think that sounds like true independence to her? First Minister. Oh. First of all, as I have said, I think on two previous occasions at First Minister's questions, Ruth Davidson is simply wrong in her assertions about the actions of the Justice Secretary. And she has brought... Uh, no evidence uh, to substantiate the claims that she is making. The Justice Secretary, the Justice Secretary behaved entirely appropriately. He asked questions about the process that the Scottish Police Authority uh, had followed. And when those questions could not be answered, the Scottish Police Authority and the then Chair of the Scottish Police Authority reconsidered that decision. And as I've said to Ruth Davidson before, if she continues to maintain that she thinks the Justice Secretary acted inappropriately in doing what he did, then logically her position must be that the Justice Secretary should not have asked those questions and the then Chief Constable should have been allowed to return to work the following day without the senior command having been informed, without Perk having been consulted about the impact and the ongoing investigation uh, and without any steps having been taken uh, to ensure the welfare of officers who had made complaints. I don't think that would have been the right course of events and I'll leave Ruth Davidson to explain why she seemingly uh, does. On the issue of appointment of the chair of the Scottish Police Authority, uh, we of course now have uh, a new chair of the Scottish Police Authority in place and of course uh, when that appointment uh, was being made, uh, firstly we have to act within the law in terms of how those appointments are made and it is laid down in law but there was an MSP uh, appointed, nominated by the uh, parliamentary subcommittee to take part in that process and, and that was something uh, that the government was uh, happy to accommodate and we are open to looking in future at how further changes can be made uh, but we have to be frank in telling parliament uh, that substantial changes to that appointments process would require uh, primary legislation uh, but we are open to discussing that and I'm sure uh, these are debates that will be taken forward in the months ahead. Ruth Davison. Well, let's look at the timeline for this and let's look at the way other statutory watchdogs are appointed, such as the Information Commissioner. That is selected by a cross-party panel that is approved by this Parliament. And as a result, in the words of the Parliament Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick, they are independent of government and able to function without fear or favour. He's right. And that is exactly what we need from a police authority chair as well. Uh, the First Minister is correct to say that five months ago, every single party in this chamber, bar the SNP, signed up for Parliament to be in charge of appointing the SPA chair. 
to take it out of the hand of ministers and, like the appointment of the Information Commissioner, to put it in the hands of this whole chamber. Five months ago, she said she'd look at it. Today, she said the same. What's happened in between? First we, Minister. What, what happened in between is that an MSP was appointed to take part in the process. So in that intervening period, the change that was made is one that was able to be made within the law that, frankly, we are bound by in making these appointments. Now, Ruth Davidson uh, may think, and in fact, she may well be right, that there are uh, different processes in place with different bodies uh, that are uh, preferable. But the point is, the, the process that we have to abide by right now is the one laid down in statute. Uh, we cannot simply ignore that. So if we want to make more substantive changes in future, then we will need to do that by primary legislation. That is something that it will be entirely appropriate for Parliament to consider, but that is what will be required. In terms of the appointment that has just been made, uh, we involved uh, Parliament in that uh, in a way that was consistent with the law uh, that we are bound by. So that was the right thing to do. Of course, we now have a new chair of the SPA in place, and I hope all of us uh, will support her in getting on with the job that she's doing, because I think she's made an excellent start to the job that she is there to do. Ruth Davidson. So the First Minister stands here again, five months after she stood here before, and says she can't go further because it would require a change in the law. Well, guess what, First Minister? This is a parliament. Changing the law is what we do. And if the First Minister is serious, if the First Minister is serious about strengthening the structure and oversight of the single police force, then having its chair appointed by Parliament and not at the grace of ministers, with or without a token person from the policing subcommittee there, is a good place to start. Now, you've said throughout this process that you're not unsympathetic. I am telling the First Minister, if she brings forward a change in the law, she will have the support from all of the Conservative benches and we can pass that change in law together. I make her this offer in good faith. Will she act on it? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, can I say uh, to Ruth Davidson, Mary Fee uh, is the chair of the policing subcommittee of this parliament. She was the MSP that took part in this process. Now, Mary Fee and I uh, are political opponents. We have many disagreements. I don't think she was a token appointment. Uh, I think she was there to do a job, and she did it. And she did it appropriately, uh, and she did it well. Now, we, of course, we can consider whether legislative change would be appropriate. Um, can I suggest that it is uh, proper to consider that fully uh, and robustly? And, and why should we take time? Because we, right now, we have a new chair of the Scottish Police Authority in place. She is at the start of her term of office. I think she's doing an excellent job, and I think we should get behind her in that. And yes, I, I think we should consider in the fullness of time before we come to appoint a new chair, uh, whether there is changes necessary. That's the right and proper way to do things, which is probably why it's not the one being proposed by the Scottish Conservatives. Question number two, Richard Lockett. Sorry, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. The merger of Scotland's eight uh, regional police forces into one national force is the biggest single public sector reform undertaken by this government. And so far, it has been nothing less than an abject failure. From the axing of over 2,000 civilian jobs to pay restraint year upon year, from the sheer incompetence that led to a VAT liability and to an IT disaster to the ongoing crisis at the top. It's been gravely demoralising for all of those rank and file officers across Scotland who turn out every shift regardless. So following the departure of yet another Chief Constable, what reassurance can the First Minister give to all those frontline officers and those remaining civilian police staff serving our communities across Scotland today? First Minister. Well, firstly, our police officers serving our communities across Scotland are, and I'm glad Richard Leonard has recognised this, doing a fantastic job. That's why we have crime now at a 43-year low 
in Scotland. And I don't think it is fair for anybody across this chamber, notwithstanding uh, the issues uh, that we have been facing, to describe policing is in any way, shape or form in a crisis. Our police officers are keeping this country and the communities of this country safe and they deserve our thanks for doing so. In order, in order to support them, we're ensuring uh, increased investment in our police service. Uh, we're ensuring that the frontline resource spending uh, of Police Scotland uh, is increasing in real terms, and that is right, and we will continue uh, to support our police service in this uh, way. Of course, we have argued uh, over many years, I think uh, we were uh, eventually backed in this by Scottish Labour, although it took a long time. Uh, we uh, argued that the position on VAT was indefensible, um, and rather than back us from day one on that, I think for a long time Labour backed the position uh, of the, the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, on that. But on the issue of a single police force, I still remember, now, if, if Labour eventually run out of members of their own ranks to be leader of the Scottish Labour Party, I'm sure Richard Lockhead would be prepared to stand in <laughs> temporarily, but I, I still remember the days when Ian Gray was leader of Scottish Labour, and actually I vividly remember, uh, the, I think it was a Saturday, watching Ian Gray's conference speech as leader of the Scottish Labour Party, uh, where he announced the policy of Scottish Labour uh, was for a single police force and criticised criticised the Scottish Government for dragging its feet in not committing to the same thing. So it used to be the case uh, when Scottish uh, Labour claimed this as its idea. So let's get behind our police service. Let's get behind... Uh, the new chair of the Scottish Police Authority uh, and when the new chief constable is, is in place and that will be on a timetable to be determined by the SPA let's get behind uh, him or her as well uh, and uh, support our police officers to continue to do the job they are doing so exceptionally well right now in keeping this country safe from crime. Richard Leonard. Well Scottish Labour did support the creation of a single force but not one that concentrated too much power in too few hands with, with too little accountability. In fact, in fact, we came up with constructive proposals, solutions to make it work. In November 2015, Scottish Labour published a review of policing in Scotland led by Graham Pearson, a former senior police officer. It came up with 10 recommendations from improved parliamentary oversight to staffing support and meaningful local accountability. We submitted it to Michael Matheson at the time. So can the First Minister tell me which, if any of its recommendations were implemented, and if not, why not? First Minister. As I assume Richard Leonard uh, knows, there has been a governance review uh, underway. That indeed is due to be published soon and no doubt will make uh, recommendations for change. And I'm very happy at that stage to go into the detail of what those recommendations might be and how the Scottish Government uh, might respond to them. Uh, Richard Leonard uh, mentions parliamentary oversight, as I've just said in exchanges with Ruth Davidson. Uh, Mary Fee, as the convener of the policing subcommittee, was involved in the process around the appointment of the chair of the Scottish Police Authority. So of course we will listen where uh, proposals are made that are sensible and, and we will continue to do so. But I come back to the fundamental point here. Nobody on these benches is seeking to deny the challenges that we have faced around the leadership uh, of Police Scotland. They are deeply regrettable and uh, let me say that uh, very, very seriously. Uh, but the central point is this. We have an excellent police force in this country. We have a police force that is working hard day in and day out to make sure that crime is at a 43 year low uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. And sometimes when I listen to the debates in this chamber, I think some members do occasionally lose sight of that fact. Richard Leonard. But you see, the problem is this week after week, the first minister stands up in this chamber and demands solutions from opposition parties solutions to problems which her government has created in the first place. And Labour offered 10, but her Justice Secretary ignored them. And since then, two Chief Constables have now gone. Morale amongst rank and file officers has sunk. Public confidence has declined. And all the time, the First Minister refuses to take responsibility. So will she take responsibility? Will she look again at the recommendations of the Pearson Review and will she find a new Justice Secretary to deliver them? 
First Minister. As, as I said in my previous answer, there has been a governance review underway. That will report shortly, and all of us right across the Parliament uh, can consider uh, any proposals and suggestions that come forward as part of that. But some of what Richard Leonard has talked about, take local engagement, for example. It is the responsibility of the Scottish Police Authority to make sure uh, that local uh, engagement arrangements are in place. Now, over the last few weeks, I have had, uh, to be fair to Richard Leonard, usually the Scottish Conservatives, but some members uh, of the Scottish Labour uh, Party have done so too, uh, come to this chamber criticising the Justice Secretary, erroneously, I may uh, add, for inappropriately interfering in the work of the Scottish Police Authority. And today, of course, they come here and they stand up and they demand that I, as First Minister and the Justice Secretary, intervene in the responsibilities of the Scottish Police Authority. We have a new chair in place of the Scottish Police Authority. She is doing a good job. I think we should get behind her. I think we should support her in seeking to tackle the challenges that have been faced. And above all, we should support the police men and women across this country that are doing such an excellent job on our behalf. Thank you. We've got three additional uh, constituency supplementaries. The first from Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Blueprint are a Glenrothes based recruitment company who were subcontracted by Carillion to provide labour for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. They are owed over £360,000 for work that's already been completed and their future now hangs in the balance. Given that the impact of Carillion's collapse reaches far beyond the company's own workforce, can the First Minister offer Blueprint any advice or support? First Minister. Well, can I thank Jenny Gilruth uh, for raising this question? Uh, can I uh, advise her that uh, I understand that Transport Scotland has actually written to uh, the company uh, this morning, and I hope uh, that letter will be helpful. Obviously, we are deeply concerned for all of Carillion's employees and subcontractors. Uh, I should say that everyone uh, will be paid for work they've been instructed to do since the company went into liquidation. Uh, so for agency workers on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, the joint venture partners, Balfour Beatty and Gallifer Tri, uh, are currently exploring ways to ensure affected agency staff and operatives can remain on that project. However, for work carried out before the company's liquidation, all of Carillion's creditors, uh, including their subcontractors, must submit their claims to the UK official receiver. Uh, the official receiver is following a legally defined process for distributing money to creditors. Uh, now, I fully appreciate that this still leaves many companies in a very difficult situation that is deeply regrettable. Uh, the British Business Bank is offering support to subcontractors uh, through uh, government guaranteed loans, I understand, up to a total fund of 100 million pounds. Uh, that will hopefully help to ease pressure on firms that are owed money uh, by Carillion. So I hope this information, uh, together with the information that Transport Scotland has provided to the company, will be uh, useful. Uh, and Keith Brown, the Economy Secretary, will be happy to continue to provide any advice that he's able to do. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, you'll be aware of the proposal for a golf development at Cool Links in Sutherland. In 2016, the Planning Minister rightly advised me this is a matter for Highland Council as Planning Authority. Since that time, I've put a, a series of freedom of information requests and indeed parliamentary questions, which have revealed the developers have had many meetings um, uh, with the uh, government, including the Rural Economy Secretary. When Donald Trump built his course in Aberdeen, we were told it would improve the environment. That site is now in danger of de-designation. Some are environmental improvement claims have been made about coal rinks. Does the First Minister not see that history is repeating itself? And First Minister, how can we have faith in a planning process when there's this level of interference? First well, Minister. I think this is really important, and I should say this is a live planning case. Uh, in this case, the planning application is currently being considered by Highland Council. Uh, but no meetings with Scottish Government ministers or officials have taken place since the planning application uh, was made. Uh, however, of course, uh, government engages with companies uh, proposing planning uh, developments and the suggestion we should never do that uh, pre-planning applications being made, uh, I think is a ridiculous one. We regularly engage trying to encourage companies to invest in Scotland, uh, but also part of the reason for the engagement is about helping people who propose major developments understand the strict planning rules that they then must adhere to. Uh, and there's a range of uh, different developments from the Lochaber Smelter, Aberdeen Harbour, uh, Inverness Castle, for example, uh, where there has been that kind of engagement, uh, but let me stress, before a planning application 
is lodged. When a planning application is lodged, it becomes live and it's entirely a matter for the planning uh, authority. Uh, that is uh, right and proper and completely follows due process. And Jenny Mara. <coughs> Now, I'm sure the First Minister's intention cannot be to tax community sports facilities and all the implications that that has for public health. But her budget looks like it will land the planned regional performance centre in Dundee with an £800,000 tax bill through the Barclay Review. Can she please take this opportunity today to reassure the people of Dundee that the Barclay Review will not tax community sports facilities and that she will deliver our regional performance centre in Dundee that she promised, that Shona Robison promised, and deliver that tax-free? First Minister. Well, Derek Mackay set out uh, in the budget and uh, partly in advance of the budget uh, the government's response to the Barclay review of business rates and there were uh, recommendations made in this uh, regard. Of course, we do not want to put burdens uh, on community sports facilities and Derek Mackay uh, has made that clear. I understand there uh, may have been some discussions or may be about to be some discussions between the Finance Secretary and Dundee City Council in respect of uh, the Dundee uh, Regional Sports Centre and I will ask Derek Mackay to update the member uh, on those discussions in due course. Thank you. We move to question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When I last asked the First Minister about the Scottish Government's oversight of publicly owned Presswick Airport, she told me very clearly that the Government had had no discussions about the relationship between the airport and the Trump Organisation. Well, thanks to the work of the Guardian newspaper, we now know that such discussions had taken place with the government's own transport agency lobbying ministers to meet with Trump's representatives and the airport being marketed as the staging post for Trump's business. But we also know that the concerns about this public asset go far deeper than that. A contractual relationship with the US military involving the servicing of aircraft on active missions. This at a time when the US has been involved in airstrikes in Syria, which the First Minister vocally opposed. The Scottish Government must take responsibility for the use of its own property in this way. So can the First Minister tell us, and if she doesn't know, will she urgently find out and report back to Parliament how many military strikes have been facilitated by Presswick Airport and its relationship with the US military? First Minister. Well, what I said to Patrick Harvey the last time he raised uh, this question in Parliament was absolutely uh, correct. I mean, there are two key so-called revelations at the heart of the story. The first is that ministers somehow lobbied Trump on behalf of Presswick Airport. And that is based on uh, the fact that Transport Scotland, uh, back in early 2015, when just incidentally, that was way before Trump was even a candidate for president, let alone president, but they passed on a request from Presswick for ministers uh, to meet with the Trump Organisation during Scotland Week in 2015. Uh, those meetings did not happen. Uh, so that uh, part of uh, this story is categorically uh, untrue. There has been no contact whatsoever by the Scottish Government or uh, Transport Scotland with the US military, with the Trump Organisation or with Trump Turnberry in relation to Presswick Airport. Uh, the second part of the uh, so-called revelations is that Presswick handles military flights, uh, including for the United States. Now, I have to say that the fact that Presswick Airport provides fixed-based operations and refuelling facilities for military flights is neither new nor is it a revelation. Its strategic plan, which was published last April, uh, talks about it. Uh, its annual accounts, published, I think, in December, talk about it. Its website actively promotes it. And what's more, Presswick Airport has been doing this kind of work for 80 years. Now, I'm not old enough to remember this. I don't think Patrick Harvey is either. But remember, uh, those who are old enough, the day Elvis Presley touched down at Presswick Airport, the reason he was there is that he was on his way home from his national service on a military plane that landed at Presswick to refuel. This is not new. It's not a revelation. It's a load of bunkum. <laughs> Patrick Harvey. That dismissive response is extremely disappointing from the First Minister. The First, the First Minister denies that meetings took place between ministers and the Trump Organisation. No one has suggested that they had, but the discussions most certainly did take place. 
And the first, the first Minister should acknowledge that the Government was aware of those discussions at the time. The First Minister also talks about the long history, an 80-year history of Presswick. Presswick Airport is Scottish Minister's property now, and that brings a new responsibility. Look, the First Minister and her colleagues have quite rightly challenged the UK Government for refusing to step in when a business that it largely owns, RBS, fails to work in the public interest. Public ownership does indeed carry a responsibility for the proper conduct of a business. Yet this public asset, which the First Minister has said should be looking to freight and retail development for its future, now appears to be basing its business model on servicing military attacks that the Scottish Government claims to oppose and promoting the toxic Trump brand, which can only damage Scotland's reputation. Full disclosure is now needed, Presiding Officer. Will the Scottish Government now release all of the information it holds on this situation with nothing redacted or held back by ministers or special advisers simply because it's inconvenient or unhelpful to the government. Will it publish? First Minister. We have published, as I understand it, it was a freedom of information request submitted by The Guardian that allowed the story that we're talking about uh, to be published in the first place. But firstly, can I just be absolutely clear, and I think Patrick Harvey's got to be careful to be clear here uh, as well, there have been no discussions uh, on the part of the Scottish Government, ministers or officials or Transport Scotland with the US military, the Trump Organisation or Trump Turnberry. Uh, that is what I said the last time in Parliament, it's what I said in my first answer and it's absolutely uh, the case. Transport Scotland passed on a request from Press Week Airport that was never followed up. The meetings uh, didn't take place. When we were first asked about this by The Guardian, uh, I think the suggestion was that it had been a request for me to do these meetings during Scotland Week in 2015. I didn't even go to Scotland Week in 2015. The meetings, the discussions did not happen. But in terms of uh, the, the work, Glasgow Press Week offers uh, refuelling and fixed-based operations uh, for a wide range of private flights, scientific research flights uh, and military flights. Uh, these are not actually contracts, they're, they're non-contractual uh, agreements that are in place. They're the same type of agreements that have been placed uh, well before the airport was in public ownership and indeed they've been in existence for decades. This is not new, it's not a revelation. This is the kind of work that Presswick, yeah, my, my mother's from Presswick, my grandparents lived in Presswick, we used to watch uh, the flights on a Sunday afternoon. This is not new. Um, and uh, I had an exciting life uh, as, <laughs> as a child. <laughs> Very few televisions in those days. I have to say, no grief, no grief. It was an exciting life. No grief. No grief that I get in this session of First Minister's Questions is going to equal the grief I get from my mother <laughs> later on for what I've just said. But look, this is a serious issue, but this is work Presswick Airport has been doing for 80 years. But let's come back to the fundamental point here. Uh, Presswick Airport wouldn't be open right now if this government hadn't stepped in to save it. We want to get it back into private hands as soon as it's possible to do so. But it's open, uh, providing employment for lots of people in Presswick uh, and uh, further afield in Ayrshire right now because of the action this government took. Thank you. We have quite a lot of requests for supplementaries here. The first from Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Stagecoach have failed to meet a number of contractual obligations they have in respect of the operation of the East Coast Mainline Service, which goes through my constituency and that of many members in this chamber. They have walked away from millions upon millions of pounds worth of taxpayer, <coughs> taxpayer obligations. Uh, will, will the First Minister now take this opportunity to join cross-party calls started by Lord Adonis to finally strip uh, Stagecoach of this franchise in its entirety? to join cross-party calls, First Minister, to have Sagecoach stripped of its franchise in this regard and prohibited from bidding for any future rail contracts in this country. First Minister. Well, I'm delighted that Alec Cole Hamilton seems to just have declared Scotland independent because Yay! this is un un unbeknown. <laughs> let, let me just explain to him... This franchise is not a franchise that the Scottish Government is a party to. This is a, a UK Government franchise. It is clearly a franchise that they have made a mess of 
And yes, I do agree, serious questions have to be asked, uh, undoubtedly of the operator and also of the UK government. And we will uh, continue to bring whatever pressure we can uh, to bear, because obviously this is an issue that matters to uh, many members of the Scottish travelling public. We will uh, bring whatever influence we can to bear to make sure those questions are asked and answered. But fundamentally, uh, this franchise is a matter for the UK uh, government. So maybe Alec Cole Hamilton would like to put some pressure on them as well. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister appears to be aware that her government and their special advisers are holding back material from FOIs that could cause them embarrassment. Does she therefore believe that saving their own blushes is more important than transparency and indeed the law? First Minister. <clears throat> the, the great irony here is that I've just been asked questions about Pat, uh, by Patrick Harvey based on information released under freedom uh, of information legislation. So if we were withholding it in some way, then presumably Patrick Harvey couldn't have asked me the questions he's just asked me. Uh, FOI requests are handled by Scottish Government officials. They seek comments from relevant parts of the Scottish Government and consider whether ministerial clearance should be sought. That's entirely appropriate because the legal duty to comply with FOI legislation lies with Scottish uh, ministers. I think it's uh, Schedule 1, Part 1, Paragraph 1. Scottish ministers uh, are subject to FOI uh, and at all times FOI requests uh, are handled in line with the legislation uh, and that includes whether or not particular exemptions are applied. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, four years ago, the SNP government promised to bring an end to the indignity of 15-minute social care visits. A report published this morning by Leonard Cheshire Disability reveals that 5,000 people in Scotland are still being subjected to 15-minute visits to support their free personal care needs. Can the First Minister explain why so many vulnerable members of our society still continue to receive these vital care visits in arbitrary 15-minute slots? Why has the government not kept their promise to end this practice? And can she tell Parliament today when these 15-minute social care visits will end in Scotland? First Minister. Well, as uh, the, the member raises a, an important issue, an issue that's important to many elderly people and their families right across the country, as I know he is aware through our ongoing reform of adult social care, we are working uh, to shift to a model of care that focuses not on tasks but on outcomes. Uh, where a person is assessed as needing a level of care, uh, we expect that to be delivered and the appropriate length of visit should be provided to ensure that care is given uh, to a high standard. 15-minute visits are only appropriate in limited circumstances, for example, to check that someone has taken their required uh, medication. So we continue uh, to work uh, towards that model of care and, of course, we're investing significantly in social care. In the current financial year, almost half a billion pounds of frontline NHS spending will be invested in social care services and uh, integration. So we will continue uh, to work uh, to deliver that shift, which is so important, not just to the older people uh, getting care right now, but to the future sustainability of our health and social care services. And Richard Lockhead. The First Minister will be aware that yesterday ministers accepted the recommendations of the group set up to improve mortuary standards in Scotland. She may also be aware that this is the result of my constituent, Mrs White and her daughters, launching a campaign to improve standards after their own horrific experience at the Murray Mortuary. So does she agree that their achievement is truly exceptional, given that they campaigned at the same time as grieving for the loss of a loved one, uh, their husband and father, Frank White? And will she join me in paying tribute to the family whose efforts should ensure that other families don't go through what they went through with improved standards ensuring the needs of grieving families are taken into account, that there's digni dignity for the deceased, and there's also better uh, working environments for the staff, and that this task now is to implement the recommendations as quickly as possible. First question. Well, can I thank Richard Lockhead both for uh, his question and indeed for his involvement on behalf of his uh, constituents uh, on this issue. Uh, we welcome the Mortuary Review Group report recommendations which aim to produce mortuary service standards across NHS boards and I think it is correct to say that this would not have happened without the commitment of the White family who very bravely shared their painful experience uh, with us and of course they continue to play a crucial role as part of the group and I do want to take the opportunity to thank them for that. Uh, the information gathered from each of our NHS boards and other providers has helped to identify areas where we need to now focus our efforts to ensure the appropriate standard of service is being provided. Uh, we want to see post-mortem examinations carried out exclusively in health board facilities in the appropriate 
appropriate environment with an agreed protocol. Uh, so our focus very much now is on implementation and I want to thank all of those, including the White family, uh, for their input in getting us to where we now are. Question for Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I am a PLO to the First Minister? To ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government is carrying out with the banking sector regarding the importance of maintaining branches across communities in rural Scotland. First Minister. Bank branch uh, closures uh, can, we know, have an adverse impact on the sustainability of communities, particularly those in rural areas. Uh, RBS and Bank of Scotland uh, closures announced at the end of last year are, of course, of particular concern. Uh, since these announcements, ministers have engaged uh, directly with the banking sector through the Financial Services Advisory Board. Uh, we certainly welcome the news that RBS has decided to keep some branches open uh, for the time being at least. However, I know there will still be many communities and staff concerned about their future. Uh, the issue of rural bank closures concerns all banks and a sector-wide approach I think is needed to ensure communities can access the services they need. So we will continue to work with all banks to ensure that essential services remain accessible to everyone. Gail Ross. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Obviously, I'm pleased about the Tongue branch in my constituency getting a, a reprieve until the end of the year, thanks to a sustained campaign by both the community and the SNP. However, WIC and Tain branches still face closure, as do a further 50 branches throughout Scotland. Will the First Minister join me in calling for RBS to listen to its biggest shareholder, the taxpayer, to stop this decimation of high street banking across Scotland. First Minister. Yes, I, I do think that RBS should uh, listen to the voice of the public on this issue. Um, that said, I do welcome their announcement uh, the other day uh, about the reprieve given to uh, 10 branches. Uh, I think that is welcome, but of course it leaves many other communities facing continued uh, uncertainty. I would pay tribute to uh, MPs led by Ian Blackford uh, who have persuaded RBS to uh, make the uh, announcement they made earlier this week. Um, I think we all understand that the way people access banking services has been and is continuing to change with online services being used much more widely. But we also know that for many local communities, uh, these banking facilities are a crucial part of the sustainability uh, of the community. So we have to find uh, the right balance uh, as we look to the future. I think a sector-wide approach is needed. As I said, we are engaging with the banking sector through the Financial Services Advisory Board and we will continue uh, to do so. But I think uh, all banks, particularly those who have had uh, the assistance that RBS has had over recent years from the taxpayer, uh, should be very attuned uh, to public opinion and I hope they will continue uh, to work hard to be so. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take to protect politicians and candidates from abuse. First Minister. Well, I think the first thing that it's important to say is freedom of speech is a crucial part of democracy. Uh, the public uh, have a right to make their views known to politicians uh, and they have a right uh, on occasions to protest if they don't like uh, the decisions that politicians uh, are taking uh, and that freedom of speech is an absolutely essential part of any healthy democracy. Uh, that said, abuse of any nature, whether it's online or otherwise, shouldn't be tolerated uh, against anyone, whether they're in public life uh, or not. Uh, the Scottish Government fully supports the police prosecutors and our courts in taking a robust approach when dealing with offending against anyone who suffers abuse. And of course, this administration introduced the statutory offence of threatening and abusive behaviour in 2010, which provides legal protections for everyone, uh, including politicians and candidates. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for that answer. In the week we celebrated some women getting the right to vote, we should realise that encouraging women into politics is not just a matter of law, it's also about culture. This Parliament has done good work in calling out sexual harassment and setting up a platform for such incidences. To that end, does the First Minister believe that a healthy political culture starts with all current politicians calling out trolling, online abuse, misogyny, and to that end, would the First Minister support setting up a platform to report it to? First Minister. Well, I mean, I'm happy to consider any suggestions about platforms for reporting, but I think we all have a responsibility here. Many of us in this chamber, uh, not exclusively, but I'm pretty sure particularly the women uh, amongst us uh, will have experienced, particularly online, uh, abuse of the most uh, horrendous nature. 
Um, I have to say I've experienced some of it from members uh, of your own party. Um, some of them uh, not called to account uh, or, or disciplined always uh, about that. So we all have to take uh, responsibility um, and you know, put across the message that it is ab not, not just justified, it's absolute right and proper in a democracy that people can share their views uh, with politicians. That's one of the great things about social media. It actually brings all of us uh, closer to those uh, we represent. But it has to be uh, in a proper uh, way, a dignified uh, and, and tolerant way, and abuse should not uh, be tolerated. So we have to all start with our own behaviour, calling out those uh, within our own parties uh, and uh, leading by examples in the standards we set. And I think if we all do that, then perhaps we can play our part in contributing to a much healthier space for public discourse uh, on social media. Because I believe very, very strongly as a a fairly avid user of, of Twitter, if not of all other social media platforms, that it should be a, a real force for good in democracy. And if we all lead by example in how we use it, then perhaps we can contribute to making sure that it is. John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Would the First Minister accept that there's a balance to be struck in all of this? Because on the one hand, we do want to protect uh, politicians and candidates and so on. But on the other hand, we have to be prepared to take a certain amount of insults a, and robust challenge, and I've certainly had a few insults along the way. First Minister. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I, do, I, do, I do agree with the point about, about balance. As I, I said in my, my previous answer, the ability to challenge politicians, the ability to criticise politicians, actually on occasion, the uh, ability to insult politicians, if that is not done abusively. It's not always comfortable for those of us who are politicians, but as an essential part of a healthy democracy in any country. Uh, but it is important that we all contribute to a public discourse that is respectful and actually encourages debate about often some difficult and complex issues uh, and doesn't e immediately uh, get reduced to the hurling of insults in, in, in different directions. So this is not always easy territory uh, for any of us, but uh, as I said earlier on, uh, where we start is with our own behaviour and the behaviour of our own parties. And if we all do that, then perhaps we will uh, help to improve something that I know is of great concern to many in politics, but particularly, I think, to women. Question number six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how the UK Government's proposed changes to the support for mortgage interest scheme could impact on householders in Scotland and whether it has asked UK Ministers to pause the introduction of these changes. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government estimates that changes to support for mortgage interest uh, being introduced by the UK Government uh, would affect between 10 and 20,000 households in Scotland, reducing social security spending by £20 million a year by 2020-2021. Uh, these changes are just another example of cost cutting with no thought uh, for whatsoever for how they will impact on those who desperately need help. In Scotland, of course, we continue to protect the most vulnerable and those in low incomes by investing over £100 million every year to mitigate the worst impacts of the UK government's welfare cut, uh, as well as arguing against uh, those cuts. But the sooner comprehensive welfare fair powers are in the hands of this parliament, the better, because that will mean we're able to make decisions that are in the best interests of the people we serve. Mark Griffin. I thank the First Minister for her response. Like the, the bedroom tax, this is another Tory policy which will hit those on low incomes, puts at risk their home and will drive them further into debt when they're already out of work. Right now, 11,000 Scots who rely on the current scheme have little over two months to decide if they will take out what is effectively a second mortgage at the behest of CERCO and the DWP. The First Minister will be aware that Royal London has published statistics showing barely 7,000 people right across the UK have moved over to that new scheme. For thousands of Scots without work, disproportionately pensioners and the disabled, they're at risk of having their home repossessed if they don't move over. My colleagues at Westminster and I, like the First Minister, would like to see the scheme reversed, the scheme changes reversed altogether. Can the First Minister um, confirm that if the Scottish Government is working with its partners in local government, the third sector, and indeed possibly lenders, uh, to be ready to step in to support anyone who should be at risk of losing their home in a matter of months? First Minister. Uh, we, will, we will, of course, work with local authorities and with other partners to provide whatever support we can to any individual uh, facing this situation. Uh, as uh, the member knows, uh, and I think, I think people across uh, the chamber know, uh, we 
mitigate as far as we possibly can the impact of welfare changes. But we cannot, uh, with the best will in the world, and believe me, we have the will, but with the best will in the world, we cannot mitigate uh, the impact of every UK government welfare change. Because when they make these cuts, they don't give us our share of the money. They keep uh, the money that they save from the cut that they make. And then e every penny of mitigation that we invest has to come from uh, the health service or education uh, or other services that we are responsible for. So we will mitigate where we can. But it comes back to the fundamental issue here. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I'm just looking here. Not one of the Tories uh, can look up, I think, from their desk uh, at the moment because we're talking here about the impact of their dreadful welfare cuts on the most vulnerable people in our society. But the real answer to this, and I, I hope Labour's position is changing and we can actually have consensus uh, and a joint approach to this, the real answer to this is to get these powers completely out of the hands of Tory governments at Westminster and into the hands of this parliament where we can exercise them in the best interests of the people we serve. I'll try to squeeze in question seven, Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First uh, Minister on what date funds from the Saltire Prize for Marine Energy will be distributed. First Minister. The Saltire Prize has already helped draw international attention to the potential of marine energy. It has sparked the interest of technology developers around the world and put Scotland and particularly Orkney and its marine expertise on the map. Uh, the prize has not, however, been awarded uh, as the independent competition judging panel's view was that no competitor was in a position to meet the criteria for it. The simple reality is that the industry has found it harder to meet the challenge than was perhaps expected back in 2008. Uh, that's why I asked officials to work with the Saltire Prize Challenge Committee to reshape the prize so it can continue to drive innovation and incentivise investment in Scotland. Research has been commissioned on the current state of the industry and a report will be published shortly, which should assist the committee with its deliberations. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that uh, response? The Saltire Prize, as she says, was launched first in 2008. It seemed barely a month went by without Mr Salmond relaunching it. Uh, the value to the marine energy sector having a statement of intent from the Scottish Government and one that might, as she says, stimulate interest in the world leading work being done on marine energy in Scotland, including in my Orkney constituency, is not in question. However, a decade on, the Saltire Prize appears to have gone the way of the historic Concordat. So does the First Minister believe the Saltire Prize will be won before the end of this Parliament? And if so, will she recognise the need for the prize to better reflect where the marine energy sector is and will be over the next few years? First Minister. Well, yes, I do recognise that, which is why I've asked uh, officials to work with the Challenge Committee to reshape the prize so that it can continue to drive innovation and incentivise investment. I, I think it's important to recognise that notwithstanding the fact that the prize hasn't been uh, awarded, the marine energy industry, and I know Liam MacArthur knows this from his constituency interest, has taken major steps forward since the prize was first established in 2008. Uh, there's a number of high-profile accesses, Nova Innovation, Atlantis, Scott Renewables, for example, but the hard reality is that the path to commercialisation it is taking longer and is proving more difficult than was initially anticipated. The industry has faced a whole series of challenges, technological, financial, environmental, the availability of grid connections, uh, and in fact the investment climate has not been helped by the UK government's decision to remove the ring fence subsidy for marine energy. Uh, so that's, uh, these are the reasons why no competitor was able to meet the deadline of June 2017. But the challenge committee, which oversees the prize, has been keeping the criteria and competitor progress under review. Uh, it asked for an up-to-date analysis of the industry before recommending a way forward for the prize. Uh, that was commissioned in 2017, and as I said earlier, that report is due to be published shortly. Thank uh, ministers and members for their time. Oh, point of order. Okay, point of order, Neil Findlay. Um, in, in relation to Rhoda Grant's question, yesterday the journalist James McEnany exposed yet again the government's conduct and their handling of freedom of information requests, uh, with special advisers uh, routinely copied into and politically interfering in replies. And the Deputy First Minister caught ordering key documents to be withdrawn. I hope you agree that this is a very serious issue. Uh, last year, this Parliament uh, supported a fully independent review of the government's performance of freedom of information. 
So can I therefore ask if you have been informed when that review will take place and how you can assist us in ensuring that the will of Parliament prevails? Uh, thank Mr Finlay. I, I do not regard that as a point of order at all. The member has made a point. The member knows that if Parliament has passed a motion, it is for the government to choose how to respond. But we do respect the will of Parliament to be responded to. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We will now move on to members' business in the name of Willie Rennie on East Nuke First Responders. We will just take a few moments for members and the Minister uh, to take their seats.